What's up guys? Welcome to my very first engineering project experience video. In these videos, I break down a project that I built and I show you the math and the science and all that in-school knowledge, how it's used in building a real-life piece of engineering technology. In other project videos I've seen on the internet, the focus on is more on like what? Like here's a cool project, here's what it does, but they don't really show you how does this work. You know, as engineers, we're the ones we have to deal with those details. So I want to show you what math did I use, what science did I use, how does that school stuff translate to the real world. So what I've built here is an automatic laser turret system. It's just like a, you know, those automatic sentry guns you see in the movies. A target will come into the view of the camera and basically this little laser pointer will shoot it. We have a program that runs all the calculations on this Raspberry Pi mini computer and there are these two servo motors that adjust the angling of the laser. So the target that I've been using to help build this system is that black square over there. It just makes it really easy for the, uh, the programming to detect it apart from the environment. And I have to admit the system isn't fully operational yet. I don't know if you can see this, but I have to press a keyboard uh, button every time I move the, the target. Uh, so I move the target, I press the keyboard, and then it takes the picture, does all the calculations you know, automatically without my control. So really, I just press that keyboard every time and then it does its thing. Uh, in the future, of course, I would be able to do it all automatically, but my focus here is the trigonometry, the math, all this stuff. And in the next part of the video, I'm going to walk you through that, show you how it works. Hope you enjoy. So, we'll start out by doing a brief overview of the system and seeing what steps make it work. First, we take a picture. Next, we use that picture to determine exactly where the target is in 3D space. And you'll see that we use X, Y, and Z coordinates to do this. With that, we'll have all the information we need to calculate what angles the servo motors need to spin at so our laser pointer is pointing at the target. And finally, we just need to turn the laser on. So looking at step one first, taking a picture is really just a matter of software. I had to download a software library that allows the Raspberry Pi to communicate with the camera. But once I had that, it's just really one line of code that allows us to take a picture using the camera and store that image into a software object that allows me to manipulate it, look at the pixels, etc. Won't talk about that too much. The focus of this video is more the math and the science, the trigonometry, the equations I used. Now step two is where things start getting mathematical and interesting. We first need to define a coordinate system so we can make our conversation more precise on where exactly our target is. We'll set up the following X, Y, and Z coordinate system. If I take my target and move it close, I'm closer to the camera, I'm decreasing my Y. If I move it side to side like this, I'm going positive X, negative X. And if I pick up that target and move it up, I'm increasing the Z, the elevation. So with that being said, how does the program running on the robot computer look at this 2D image and determine where exactly in 3D space this target is relative to the camera point, the origin? We'll start with how we determine the Y coordinate, that distance from the image first. So we're all familiar with how cameras work. If I was to move this target closer, it would appear bigger and bigger. It would take up more screen size. Now the way we measure how big the target is on our 2D image is we measure how many pixels make up the target. And this is what I call the pixel area. It's just a total count of all of how many pixels make up this target. And of course, we have a relationship here. As I move that target closer to the camera and my Y coordinate decreases, my pixel area will increase. And I was thinking, everything's math. There has to be some sort of equation out there, something that allows us to describe, completely specify this relationship. Some equation out there is such that when I plug in the pixel area, the wide coordinate of the target, that distance comes out. 
So to figure out this equation, I took some data. I put the target in front of the camera. I measured the distance, that Y coordinate, manually with the, a ruler. And I took a picture and measured how many pixels made up the target. And this formed one data point on my graph. And this data point made sense. I was starting out with the target being very close to the camera. So it makes sense that the Y is small, the distance is close, and the pixel area is large. So I kept repeating this process. I took my target. I moved it a little bit more away, measured a new distance, took a new picture, and measured the pixel area of the target. And of course, for my new data point, the pixel area was smaller. Now I was wondering, is this relationship going to be a simple line? Maybe it's going to be more exponential? So I kept doing this process, and I figured out that this did, yes, seem to be some sort of exponential relationship. And here was my exact data. So to find the equation that connects all my data points, I had to do something called regression. And really, I didn't do it. Excel did it. It's just a mathematical process of finding the equation that best fits your data. Excel makes it super easy. The equation was this. So, just in this one equation, it summarizes exactly how the target grows larger on the screen as it approaches the camera. So all I got to do when I take my picture is count up those pixels of that target, plug it into this equation, and out comes my y-coordinate. And of course, this equation went right into the code. Now, we'll talk about the x and the z-coordinates as they're calculated using the same technique. So let's focus on the x-coordinate. How can we visualize the x-coordinate of this target? Well, for example, it might be a 3. And keep in mind that we're measuring these coordinates to the center of the target square. Well, another way of visualizing the x-coordinate is imagine that the y-axis is extended out on a straight line, that x-coordinate would also be the length of this yellow line over here. We can also visualize our coordinate system on our 2D image. The x and the z are the same, it's just that the y is extending away from the camera, into the screen you might say. So on our 2D image, this might be the x-coordinate. That would be 6. Now the problem is, this 6 here would be measured in pixels. My image recognition library, SimpleCV, allows me to detect the center of the target. I know my image dimensions, 1920 by 1080. So therefore, I can calculate this distance, but again, it's in pixels. I need to convert it into millimeters, real, actual units of length. So here's how I did that. This square target here was of known length. And I measured its side length to be 107.4 millimeters. From the software, I could measure the length of that square in pixels. And just to give it sort of a fake number we can work with, let's say it was five pixels. And I can view these two numbers as a ratio. Every five pixels I go out on this table is equivalent to going 107.4 millimeters in real length. So this is very powerful because using this as a ratio, I can calculate the real length of anything on this table. In fact, I could calculate the actual length of this table itself. For instance, let's just say I knew it to be 40 pixels wide. I could use this cross multiply and figure out the actual length of that table, of course, in millimeters. 
instead of using this phenomenon to calculate the actual length of the table, I wanted to use it to calculate whatever this actual length was. So if my software told me that, hey, the target center is six pixels to the right of the center of the image, I would put six into this ratio, and the actual x coordinate of the target would come out. And I use this exact same technique for z. I measure the z coordinate of our target in pixels, might be 3, and again use this ratio to calculate the z. And of course, these two techniques are right in the code as well. And this is where I started running into problems. Of course, I have to test this system I came up with and make sure it actually works. Make sure it gives me the correct x, y, and z values of the target. So I tested the y first. I moved the target back and forth a couple of times, took some pictures, and it seemed like my system was giving me the correct y values. I was verifying it by checking with the yardstick. So next I had to test the linear ratio technique. And I figured it would be easier to test this technique using the Z. I had measured that the camera was 102 millimeters off the ground. And I had measured that the target center was 195. So simple subtraction told me that my system should tell me that the Z coordinate of the target was 93. When I ran the system, it said that the Z was 60. And this freaked me out because I had no idea what the problem was. I thought back to the theory. It checked out. seemed like everything made sense. I checked my code. Everything was good there. It's not like working on a homework problem where you know all you got to do is read the section of the book again to figure out where you went wrong or how you need to fix it. When you're doing these projects, you have no idea what the problem is. And you really just have to follow the clues until you find it. So, I drew out the problem. And I always recommend that you do that whenever you're stuck with any problem. Drawing it out, visualizing it, just really kicks your brain into high gear. And allows those answers and possibilities to get to your brain quicker. I knew that for this test, the distance was a thousand 437 millimeters. And I'm thinking, all right, this is what should be happening. Why does my system think that it's only 60? How is it even possible? And then it came to me. It's possible that my camera was actually tilted up a bit, such that it thought that this is the center line. It thought that this was the y-axis. And in that case, yes, it would think that the z-coordinate was smaller than it actually was. So there, I had identified the problem. And the solution was to figure out what that angle of elevation was. I simplified my picture, removed all the stuff I didn't need. Here was my goal, to determine this angle of elevation theta. Because we have a right triangle, that makes this right here phi, the complementary angle. Remember, complementary angles are ones that add up to 90. So I just started writing down all the equations I could. If this is phi right here, that means for a much smaller right triangle, that's phi right there. I split that 93 into two parts. A height 1, which is the hypotenuse of that top right triangle, and a height 2. So that was the second equation. h1 plus h2 is equal to 93. Focusing on this top right triangle, I could use sine. Because I had the opposite, I had the variable for the hypotenuse, so I wrote the sine of angle phi is equal to the opposite of 60 over the hypotenuse h1 
and I realized I could make a similar trigonometric statement with the lower right triangle, except this time I had the opposite and the adjacent, which meant I could use tangent. The tangent of theta, that actual angle of elevation I was going for, was equal to the h2 over the 1437. So I took a step back. How many unknowns did I have? One, two, three, four. And I had four equations, which meant I could solve this system of equations and figure out what that angle of elevation was. So doing exactly that, that angle of elevation turned out to be around 1.23 degrees. And it doesn't seem like a lot, but remember the way angles work. If I have even a little bit of an angle, the farther we travel, the farther they get off. And of course, this was clearly causing too much of an error in my z measurement. So I combined all four of these equations into one equation. And this one equation is in my code. Every time I calculate a z, I have to do a bit of a trigonometric adjustment to compensate for that angle of elevation. So I'd love to say that my problems ended after this and the project was smooth sailing. Now that the z was good, I wanted to test out the x. So I started moving the target over this way a bit. And that was fine. I was getting good z and good x values. The problem was my y was getting off a bit. Now at first I thought this was just normal uncertainty in the image recognition software. Of course, no piece of technology is perfect. I noticed that the software wasn't actually able to get all of the black pixels in here. Of course, it's going to miss a bit. And if it's missing some of those pixels, of course, my y value coming out of my equation is going to be off. Going back to my y equation data, I realized that being off by some number of pixels would actually be very bad the farther away that the target was away from the camera. And this is essentially the concept of the derivative. Look how steep my graph is in this vicinity. With just a very small run, a very small difference in pixel area, I'm getting a huge corresponding difference in the y coordinate that I calculate. That's not good. If I'm always going to be off by a little bit because of the imperfection of my pixel sensing software, at these bigger distances away, the corresponding error in my y is going to be bigger and bigger. Much different at closer range, much more gradual slope. And I can be off by a huge amount of pixels and still only incur a little bit of difference in my y calculation. So I was going to be off in my y. The question now was, how much would that affect the ability of the laser pointer dot to make it to hit the exact center of the target? Without a doubt, if I'm off in the Y, it's going to cause that laser to miss the center of the target by some amount. The question was, how much? So let's say we were looking at the situation from a top view. Got my camera here, my laser here, and this is where my system thinks the target is. And because of this, the laser would be rotated to some angle, and it would shoot to the center of the target. But let's say the system is off in the Y a bit, and the target is actually here. How much will my laser impact point be off from the center? So here's how much my system misjudged the Y coordinate. Here's that same angle theta. And here's the amount I'm off in the X caused by my error in the Y. And it looks like it's the tangent that relates these two. So I'm going to get that delta x by itself so I can analyze what's going on. Now, remember how tangent works. If my angle is between 0 and 45 degrees, the number coming out of the tangent 
is really less than 1, between 0 and 1. It's essentially a percentage. For instance, 50%, which means that my error in x will always be less than my error in y. But of course, if that turd angle is bigger than 45 degrees, that means the number coming out of the tangent is going to be greater than 1. We're going to be operating in this region of the tangent graph, which really means my x error will be greater than my y error. So I was concluding that because of the error in the y produced by the pixel uncertainty from my software, I was going to want to make sure that the target center stayed in this plus 45, minus 45 window. So I thought I had cracked another problem. But as I kept moving that target to greater x values, my pixel area kept getting more inaccurate. And this defied all logic for me. I thought that as you move the target closer, pixel area increases. And as you move it farther away, it decreases. But it seemed that if I just move it side to side, it changes as well. And that made no sense. Unfortunately, this was happening. I took some data. At a constant distance, I moved the target along the x. And unfortunately, the pixel area kept increasing. And this is something I called image warping. And I had no idea why this was happening. You know, I theorized that maybe because my lens is, you know, a concave lens or something like that, the light was coming in and reflect, refracting or reflecting, or I just didn't have the energy to deal with the entire new field of optics. So what I did was I took some data and I tried to at least figure out the pattern that captured this phenomenon. So I got this equation here. So it looked like, again, I was going to have to do an adjustment. Every time I calculated a pixel area and an x-coordinate, I was going to have to reduce that pixel area via this equation. And the key was finding this value right here. What is the pixel area when x is equal to 0? Which is really this value right here. When you plug in 0 into a quadratic equation, the only term that comes out is the c term right here. So every time I calculate a pixel area, it goes in here. Every time I calculate an x, it goes into here. And I solve for the c term here, because it represents what the true area should be when x is equal to 0. So finally, after I put this equation into the code, I was actually getting good x, y, and z values for my target location. Step 2 was undoubtedly the hardest phase of this project. And by comparison, steps 3 and 4 were unbelievably easy. Let's again return to our top view and talk about what angle the bottom motor needs to swivel at so that we're po pointing at the target. If the target was on the right, our angles would be positive. And if it was on the left, the angles would be negative. Also, I had to do a little bit of math to take the coordinates relative to the camera and shift them to be relative to the turret. I could easily calculate that angle by using the tangent. To calculate the angle of our top motor, we can see from this side view over here that we just needed the z coordinate relative to the turret, of course, and we also needed this yellow distance. Now, this yellow distance is actually the hypotenuse of this right triangle over here. It's just that since we're looking from a top view, it's technically covered by this red line. But remember, this laser line is tilted up by the rotation of that top motor. So this yellow line here is technically underneath this red line right here. And because of this, our top angle was also calculated using the tangent as well. So if I had to try and draw in 3D, Here's my y, my x, and my bottom angle. And here's z and the top angle. 
Even the electronics for controlling the laser weren't too bad. The laser is essentially just a light bulb. If you hook it up to a battery and to send electricity through it, it's going to turn on. Obviously, I didn't want the laser to always be on. So the solution is to put a switch right here. Think of it as a light switch. Flick it on, light goes on, flick it off, light turns off. Now, of course, I don't want to be turning the laser on myself. I want the program running on the Raspberry Pi to do that for me. So instead of making this a light switch, we use what's called a transistor. And that's what this thing is right here. But it acts basically the same way as a light switch. Electricity will only run through it as long as another device is sending electricity into it. So in this case, the Raspberry Pi was kind of acting as my finger. Now, of course, the Raspberry Pi does not provide electricity. It's got to be powered by a battery, or in my case, I was using the electricity from the wall. we got to be careful here. The wall can provide a lot of electricity. If too much of it flows through the Raspberry Pi, it's going to break the delicate circuits that are in it. So the solution is to put a big resistor in the circuit with the Raspberry Pi. So the current going through it would be small. And that's exactly what these guys are. All these are a whole bunch of resistors that basically add up and act as one big resistor. A whole bunch of resistors in series if you've taken physics. So when all the calculations have been made, my program turns on the electricity for the Raspberry Pi, allows a little bit to flow, turns the transistor on, and allows electricity to flow through this circuit. And that is how my project works. It definitely had its ups and its downs, its frustrating moments. And there are some times when I just wanted to throw it out of a window. But this is honestly just how projects feel. Things won't work out the way you expect them to. Well, just plain go wrong all of a sudden. And you have to apply your engineering knowledge and your problem solving skills in ways you would have never expected. But this is all great experience. Being able to go through all this and build a working project is the ultimate engineering challenge. It's the final step in your engineering journey. Because you've learned the concepts, you've practiced the problems, and now you're ready to apply this stuff to the real world. Thanks for watching. Feel free to share this video with anyone who may be interested in robotics or engineering especially those students in middle school or high school. I really wanted to show them some situations where math is actually used and how important it is to understand the concepts because I didn't take one derivative in this project, but it was the understanding of the derivative that really allowed me to assess my project on a deeper level. If you have any questions or comments, please post them. I'd love to hear what you guys think. I have a link to my code in the description so you can check that out too. I'm going to try and bust out a new project every two months. So if you like these type of project videos where I really break things down, subscribe to my channel so you'll know when the next one drops. Once again, thanks for watching and have a great day.